Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Again, like I said before, we've been on a series called Asking in Faith, Praying and Receiving Answers. But let's look at our main subject. Our main text still is the same text. It's in the book of Matthew chapter 21 and it's verse 22. We, it's because of this thing that Jesus said that we are doing this series. He says, you can pray for anything and if you have faith, you will receive it. For the benefit of those who may not have watched the first part and the second part, if you have faith is the question there. If you have faith, if you have faith is a condition kind of saying that if you have faith, then something will happen. If you don't, then who knows what will happen. Um, amen. So that's what triggered this. And I'm, we're trying to now understand, okay, what kind of faith is Jesus talking about? Faith in what? Is it, yes, faith in God, absolutely. But how? How do I know if I have that as faith in God to receive answer to the prayers that I've prayed? Hence, we're talking about all of this in this series. Okay, so um, again, like I said earlier, the title is this, but... Let me just read the book of Mark before we now mention the two points that we've already covered. The book of Mark in verse 11, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said to the disciples, and a bit of background here is when he did the miracle. It's the same kind of story that led to the Matthew one. But in the book of Mark, it, when Peter came back and saw that the fig tree that Jesus caused one day, the next morning the fig tree died from the root die completely you know you're looking at a tree that is full of green and all of that i mean it takes a whole season before a tree goes to you know like in the autumn it goes brown and all of that just the leaves drops that doesn't mean the tree will die but jesus spoke to a tree and told the tree let no man eat of you again and then the next morning when the disciples came the tree is dead d-e-d -E -D, dead it's almost like pure firewood sorry yeah, you know what I mean? I'm just joking with the DED. All right. And then when they saw that, they started thinking, wow, Jesus, what, Master, what happened? The tree you spoke to have just died. And Jesus then said this word we're looking at on the screen now. Jesus then said to the disciples, read that word with me loud if you can, have faith in God. Master, the tree that you cursed yesterday that you said let no man speak of you all that jesus did was speak he didn't do more than speaking he didn't go there get an ask and start hitting it with an ask he didn't go around the tree run around it three times and jump around it and do all kinds of things you know can take much more incantation than that no he just said let no man eat of you again and he walked off i love that part take note of that part that he actually just moved on. Praise God. Can someone say, moved on? That's, that's important. Say it after me. Say, moved on. moved on. He said the word. Say that with me, please. He said the word. He said the word. And he moved on. Okay. You will see later why we're talking about it. He only just spoke and then he moved on. Then the disciples were the one now reminding him, wow, that thing you prayed for, has actually been, has happened. And they are shocked that it happened in such a quick time. But Jesus wasn't shocked because he is in a different frame of mind. He was, he moved on already, knowing that it will happen. Whether it happened the next morning or the next 10 days, it doesn't matter. He knows it will happen. Praise God. And then they say, when they say that, he now said to them, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to them, this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in you. Let's pause for a minute. Can I ask a question, everyone watching online and those in the room here? Was Jesus referring to a physical mountain? Okay, 
I've given enough pause for it. I've got a no and I've got an absolutely. I joined the absolutely. He was literally talking about a physical mountain. You know why? The context. He just spoke to a tree and the tree just died in seconds, in whatever, in, in ridiculous speed of time. Something that doesn't make sense. Why should it, why did, why are you cursing the tree? We don't know, but at least he chose to do that. Or he's seen, seen the need for the tree to die. Even if it's just to teach us a lesson, just to use it to teach me and you 2,000 years on a lesson. He spoke to a tree and the tree died. And he now said to them, standing on the mountain, and said, now this mountain that we're standing on, you can actually speak to this mountain and tell the mountain, get up. I want you to move. You're blocking my way. Get to the other side. But take note of that thing in bold letters. He says, but you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. You must really believe it will happen. The only way you can really believe it will happen is based on the two points that we've already covered. Praise God. Amen. The only way you can really believe that you can move a mountain <laughs> when you are just so tiny and next to the mountain that faith cannot be based on your own strength. And he says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe, you will receive it. Sorry, if you believe you have received it, it will be yours. I love this one. This is actually the same text, our main text. This is it again. But in the book of Mark, I love the way he now said it. If you believe that you have received it, in other words, there is a lot of an assumption here. Think with me. If I ask my wife, Cheesy, get me a cup of water. Now, what it means is that using this explanation Jesus is saying here, it means that I should just relax and believe that I have got the cup of water, even though I have not got the cup of water physically in my hands. Do you get, are you tracking with me? What that means is that the person I spoke to is trustworthy and capable and would want to do it at the same time for me to believe that I have it. If I believe that I have something that I, it's not me that I'm, but I'm asking someone, if you pray, pray means you're talk, asking to someone, you're asking God something for anything. If you believe that you've received it, means that your trust is in something. Your trust has to be in the willingness of God wanting to do that, which is what we've already covered and I'm going to mention it soon. Number two, the ability of God to do that. So like I mentioned again, if I ask Chizzy to give me a cup of water, does she have the willingness to give me a cup of water? Does she have the ability to get up and go and get it? And can I trust her enough that if she says she will get me that water, she actually goes and get it? Praise God. This scripture is very big, although simple. Because we will say, but no, does Jesus mean anything when he said anything? He meant anything. But that anything is, bent, is dependent on the person you're asking. Praise God. Do you get it? He says, when he says, ask anything, that anything is dependent on the person I'm asking. Okay, let's reverse it a bit. So I now ask Cheesy to get me Something that she doesn't like, but I am the one asking it. Something that she doesn't like, and if because she one, she doesn't like it. Two, she doesn't. If she doesn't like it, she also doesn't believe that anyone should have that. Now, even though she is able to do it, in other words, all powerful, but she doesn't want to do it, which is not in line with her will. And at the same time, hasn't given me any promise that she would do that. Even though I've asked anything, would I get that? No, you wouldn't. So that anything is based on the person you're asking. 
not just based on you. And so that's just to, a side note for the thoughts that might say, oh, but do, do we believe Jesus' word literally? Believe it literally, but you have to remember you're asking God, so your asking has to be in line with his will. Amen. Amen. That's just, just a point, a side note. Okay, now let's cover the, remind us quickly, quickly, literally, the two points we've covered. Point number one, anyone? Trust in God's unfailing love for you. Believe in the goodness of God. We read some scriptures on this, and I'm not going to do that today. Trust in God's unfailing love. This simply means that because of the love that God has for you, and because God is good, he wants to help you. Amen. I read the book of Peter for us on this. That's the main scripture we had for this, which says that cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. He wants to help you. Not that you have to beg him to help you. He wants to help you. That's number one. Okay, so number two, trust in God's mighty power. We spent a lot of time also on this one a week ago it simply means oh and mighty is now corrected it, <laughs> trust in god's mighty power believe in the greatness of god amen what is this saying this is talking about he can do it he is great enough he's big enough he's mighty enough he's powerful enough to do whatever it is that you are asking him to do and he actually wants to do because he is a good God. Those two points is what we've covered. Now we're going to go into the third point, okay? So I hope you're writing. Now, for the third point, this is where I was already hinting what Jesus did. Remember what I said? Jesus spoke and did what? Remember what I told you to repeat? He spoke and moved on. Jesus spoke and moved on. Point number three, rest in God's promises. Believe in the faithfulness of God. I've already kind of hinted this before I even got to it. If I ask, again, I'm using my simple example. If I ask Cheesy to get me water. She wants me to drink water. That's the unfailing love part. She's good. She knows that I need to drink water. So even before I ask, she gets me, she's willing to get me water. Trust in the mighty power and the greatness of God. Cheesy has two legs. My wife has two legs. She can do it. She can physically get and do it. Nothing can stop her from here to there to get the water. So that's his mighty power then rest in the promise of God. I know that she, when she says, I will get you water, she will definitely go and get it, even though she's human. Now, but we're not talking about a God that is at another level that we don't even understand fully. So when we talk about the faithfulness of God, you know that this God means exactly what he says. Let's read some few scriptures, and I have few for us today. The psalmist, David, King David, wrote this in the book of Psalm chapter 3. He said, I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I love that statement alone. Even. Why would David lie down and sleep? is because the Lord is watching over him. Now, when you read that scripture, you think, wow, he says anyone can sleep anywhere. You can just lie down and sleep. But take note of the thing in the between. He says in safety. Why did he say in safety? Even though you think reading this, the next line tells you David was writing this because his enemies actually was just all around him. And yet David was lying down and sleeping. But the point is, the Lord is watching over me. That's the goodness of God here. Now he says, I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on 
every side. So the fact that he's saying, I laid down to sleep, does not mean every, the road is easy. Does not mean everything I'm trusting, that everything I want is happening for me. But yet, he lies down to sleep and he's not afraid. Why? Because the Lord is watching over him. Praise God. That's actually the scripture I feel like to share. There's more. But I feel that this one hits the nail because I said Jesus spoke and he walked away. Jesus was the, the miracle, said what he needs to say. He doesn't stand there and say, oh my goodness, does it happen? What do I do? <laughs> what if it doesn't? No, he says it and he goes on to sleep. Why? Because the Lord is watching over you. That's trusting in the faithfulness of the God who says something and says it. Let, let's look at the meaning of the word faithfulness. Faithfulness. The word faithfulness, this, this is from the dictionary literally. I will focus on number two and number three of that. It says the fact or quality of being true to one's word or commitments as to what one has pledged to do. If I pledge to do something, I am even full of failures and mistakes, but there are things when I say I would do, no matter what it would take me, I would do it. Even if I have to sit down, back hurting, knee hurting, I will do it. That's human being. And if a human being will even commit to some of those things and be faithful in some little things, God is all faithful. He says, the, number three, he says, the fact or quality of being dedicated and steadfast in performing one's duty. You know, this guy knows how to do his job. A faithful person, if you say that someone is faithfulness, has faithfulness in them, is a person that does their work. Amen. Amen. Attribute that to God. Believe in the faithfulness of God. What does that mean? Believe in the promises of God. If God says, I will help you, what does that mean? He is committed to his word. If God says, I will heal you, he will definitely heal you. If God says, I will rescue you, there's nothing these people will do to you. Don't fear any man. Trust me and I will lift your head up. God will definitely lift your head up if you trust him. Whenever God then puts a condition, just do your part in that condition. He will definitely do his. Amen. Amen. Hence why Jesus will say what he says. If you ask, believe. Don't doubt, just believe, trust God. He will do his own part. Amen. Amen. Believe in the faithfulness of God. David goes on in, that, in Psalm 31 from verse 3 says, You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this danger. Pull me through from the trap of my enemies, the trap my enemies set for me. For you, I find protection in you alone. I, this scripture, I love this scripture so much. I entrust my spirit into your hands, into your hand. Rescue me, O Lord, for you are what? Faithful. The reason why David can entrust his Life into God's hand is because God is faithful. You know, we read that scripture and we almost don't know it. That scripture is a famous scripture, but many people don't know it. Let's read it again in the Amplified Version. You start recognizing it. Into your hands I commit my spirit. For you redeemed me, you have redeemed me, O oh Lord, the God of truth and faithfulness. Is it a bit more familiar now, that scripture? Okay. There are two people I told you two weeks ago that 
trust completely in God's love for them. I said King David, and I said the second person was who? The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus quoted David as his final words on earth. When Jesus was on the cross and said everything he needed to say, guess what he said? It was the same word that David wrote because he believed in the faithfulness of God. Jesus said it in the book of Matthew, Luke chapter 23. He says, Jesus said, cried out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with these words, he expired. That means he breathed his last. He said it and he walked away. Take note of this statement. He said it and he left everything in God's hands. There are many times we pray, but we are not leaving it in God's hands. Many times we ask God for something, but we haven't left it in God's hands. We're still carrying the burden with us. And so we've coined up all kinds of things to support our weakness in faith. We coined up all kinds of things like to say, oh no, you keep praying until you pray through. And it sounds all noble. It does sound noble. But could it be that the reason why you haven't prayed through that first time is because you're still in doubt? I'm asking the questions. Could it be? I'm not making any conclusion. Because I haven't seen Jesus not praying through at any one time. Yes, he was still, still in, full of burden, but he always knows how to let it go once he leaves the, bud, the, 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 the place of prayer. Amen. What I, I'm talking about, rest in God's promises. Believe in the faithfulness of God. We might not even understand the scripture that well, and I left it here on the screen so you can think about it with me for a bit. Did you know that when Jesus died on the cross, he did not belong to the Father? He rightfully belonged to Satan. Or else that would not be judgment. He said before this statement, Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? It's the same words that would have done would have, the way God, almost the angel, just stood by the Garden of Eden and said, Adam, all right, there you go, out of this place. Jesus felt the, almost as if the Father said, it is done. You've taken the sin of every single human being on earth and put on one man, Jesus. He rightfully belonged to sin and death and his enemy, Satan. But that was the wisdom of God. Praise God. Why? Because God has promised that on the third day, I will raise you back up again. Trust in the promise of God. Jesus was suffering. He knew this is difficult. Not just what he's going to suffer in the body, but also what he's going to suffer in the spirit. He knew that this is going to be difficult. I am not just going to suffer die, the pain, the slapping, the cane, and all of that. I'm also going to, for the first time in my life, going to be without the Father. And I'm not going to be left in the hands, in the messy hands of this enemy. Remember when Jesus was alive and walking on earth, he said to him something as he said, Set is looking for things to do. He has nothing on me. Why? Because he can't find any sin in Jesus. He says, Satan's got nothing on me. Completely pure, completely righteous. But on that cross, things changed. Yes. Or else your sin was not taken. Yes. He was heading to Hades. He went there. He had to go there. And by the way, well, it might be no time in God's time. In our time, it was three days. So for three good days in our human thinking and understanding and calculation, Jesus was in the hands of the wicked one. But that was the wisdom of God 
That was the promise of God. On the third day, I will bring you back up again. And so Jesus spoke that last word, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I trust in your faithfulness. Are you trusting God for healing today? Why don't you say, God, for my back pain, into your hands I've prayed. I believe in your mighty power. I believe in your love for me. And now I believe in your word that you say you are the God that heals me. Into your hands I commit my body. Into your hands I commit my children. Into your hands I commit my business. Rest in God's promises, friends. This is how to pray and receive answers. Amen. Without fretting, panicking, running here and there and everywhere. We ought to always rest in God's promises instead of worry because of we lack faith. It is actually lack of faith that brings the worry. I'm not the one making it up. Jesus said it. Look at what Jesus said. In the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, he says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store that means go to work and earn your salary and bank it. Put it in a bank or invest it or save it. It says, for your heavenly father feeds them and aren't you, I love this word, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? You know, if you have a dog, have you ever wondered, that dog doesn't go for, to work. But somehow God feeds him through you. You know, sometimes you might not be happy with your dog, but guess what? Somehow softness and tenderness comes into your heart and you're like, okay, here you go. Take the chicken. Eat it already. Don't you think that you are more valuable to God than that dog? That God can still touch someone else's heart. Who doesn't want to bless you in the first place? And all of a sudden, one day, they're like, Okay, yeah, you yeah, take that money. Here we go. Give it to that boy. My point is, I'm done using a bit of an extreme there. Point is, you are far more important to God than any animal you can think of. And yet God feeds these animals through the yearly cycles. Call, can't you, can all your worry add a single moment to your life? No. Why, and why worry? Why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the valley and how they grow. Don't they, they don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And verse 30 says, and if God, let's read this together, go. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Do you see what I'm saying? Jesus already brought worry in the line and said, the reason why there's no there's worry is the faith is dwindling. Is our faith is disappearing, kind of. And so the more our faith is disappearing, the more the worry is coming up. So maybe as a way of advice, if you find yourself worrying about something too much, that, let that be a symptom. You don't need anyone to tell you. Let it be a symptom for you to say, maybe I have not trust in God enough in this area. Just be honest with yourself and come to the place where you say, God, into your hands, I commit this issue. Amen. Why? For he cares, point number one, his unfailing love. Trust in that unfailing love and also trust that he can do it. Amen. 
All right. So we're talking about Asking in Faith, the series part three, and we are coming to an end right now. But I just want to remind you again that Jesus went on to say, therefore, do not worry or be anxious. What, and all of those things. And he goes on to say in verse 32, the world is craving for this kind of things. Why are we doing the same thing they're doing? Why are we panicking and rushing up and down? I highlighted those three words. They say the Gentiles wish for, crave, and they diligently seek for these things. But if you read with me that big, bold ones, your heavenly father knows well that you need all of them. In other words, God knows that I need to fix my car. God knows that I need to, to rest physically. God knows everything that I have need for. So why worry? Why panic? There's no need for it. Amen. Amen. But seek first, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness. That means his way of doing and being right. Then all these things taken together, simply means added together will be given you besides. In other words, be added to you. Amen. In conclusion, as the worship team gets ready, let me just remind us again what we've covered. Trust to pray and receive answers, we have to trust in God's unfailing love. That means believe in the goodness of God. Trust in the mighty power of God. That means believe in the greatness of God. Take note of those things highlighted on the, on the left, right hand side of your screen, which is goodness, greatness, and faithfulness. Say that after me, goodness, faithfulness, sorry, greatness and faithfulness. Again, one more time, goodness of God, greatness of God and faithfulness of God. These things keep repeating and keep reminding, whenever you're praying, ask yourself, I, do I believe that he is good enough to give me this, that he wants to do it? While you're praying, ask yourself, do I believe that he is powerful enough to do that? And then while you're praying, ask yourself, have I seen a word for this? Have I received a promise from him on this? If you have received a promise, you can go and sleep. Because he is faithful to his duty. He, keeps, he does his own job. If he says, I'll meet with you at the cool of the evening, he will come at the cool of evening. It will be you that will not be available. If God says, start a meeting and I will heal the people, he will heal the people. It will only be that we didn't come in the way he wants us to come. Amen. He never disappoints. So to make it easier for us, think of it this way. Another way to think of these three points, and I'm going to leave it on the screen for a bit for, for not writing. God wants to answer your prayers. Why? Because he is good. He wants to. Number two, God can answer your prayers because he is great. And number three, God will answer your prayers because he is faithful. God wants to answer your prayers because he is good. God can answer your prayers because he is great. And God will answer your prayers because he is faithful. And that's why the Bible tells, tells us through Apostle Paul that there is a rest that's still awaiting God's people. What does this mean? A rest that is still awaiting God's people. You know, you could attribute that to heaven, isn't it? Yeah? Good, good, good. But even if it is, <laughs> let me tell you something. So let's think, you know, because so, someone can argue and say, that rest still awaiting God's people is heaven. Yeah? Good. No problem. Even if it is, you know what Jesus said to us? You know how many times the scripture said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here. Where? Here on earth. How? 
as it is in heaven. In other words, the rest that is awaiting for you in heaven, you can experience it here on earth. That's why Paul will say to us, you're no longer, your address is no longer earth. You are seated in the heavenly places, far above principalities and above all powers and rulers. You are seated with Christ Jesus. So this rest that is awaiting for us, both in heaven, God wants you to experience it here on earth. Again, this is why Jesus will sleep, why the storm is shaking the boat. He is experiencing the rest of heaven here on earth because heaven's power oh, supersedes anything here on earth. So Paul says, for all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors. Let's rest from this labor. This doesn't, it's actually to help our prayer, not to stop us praying. Praise God. It doesn't mean stop praying. No, it means pray, but pray with the mind that God will and God can, and sorry, that God wants to and God can and God will answer your prayer and then go into rest. Praise God. And so let us do our best to enter this rest. Father, I thank you for your people. Thank you for everyone who has listened to this word or who will listen to it with a heart of humility and, and wants to know how to talk to you about things and how to cooperate with you about any project, any adventure, anything at all. Lord, I pray that this message will dwell strongly in our hearts, all of Favor House members and those who are friends of Favor House, all those who are watching who might not even know the, the church, Favor House. Father, I pray that this will touch the body of Christ, that this word will resonate in the minds of your people and encourage them to trust you and come into the place of rest to see your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, help us to come to that place of peace. That's what you promised us. He says, my peace I give to you. Receive that peace of God right now if you're watching. Receive the peace of God in the area of your quest, quest and prayer requests. That prayer you've been fighting and fighting and trying to fight with the devil, fight with this person. You don't need all of that. Trust in God's goodness. Trust in God's greatness. Trust in the faithfulness of God. And you will see what God will do in your life moving onwards from today in the mighty name of Jesus. Anything you pray, anything you ask, Father, this is the portion of the name of Jesus. Amen.